It is good to see you and good to be with you this evening and hope you've had a good uh, first part of the week. Um, let's take a minute and think about our, our prayer list, our sick list, and those that you might know of. You may have some updates on some of these folks. Uh, as far as I am aware, uh, we still have uh, three people in uh, the hospital, at Huntsville Hospital, uh, Naaman and Frida Sadler and John Fultz. Um, uh, Naaman is doing much better as far as how he feels. They did put a stint in um, Monday afternoon, uh, and that helped a whole lot. He is still going to have to have surgery, but they can't do that for a little while now that he's had the stint. Uh, so they're going to have to wait on all that to heal and, and for him to get over that completely before they do a surgery. So, But he was, he was feeling much better uh, yesterday when I saw him. Um, who else do you know of besides those three who we, we need to be thinking about? Um, I don't, other than that she's home. Yeah, Glenda might. Uh, that is uh, a pretty difficult pr surgery and procedure, I think, yeah. That was Linda Bramlett, in case some of you didn't hear uh, who it was we were talking about. Um, anyone else? Yeah, we, we have that, uh, you know, a uh, pretty extensive list of, of people that we don't need, certainly don't need to, to forget or overlook. Um, Mandy is, is continuing uh, to go through her treatments. Ruth is at Regency uh, in rehab. Uh, and uh, so we need to, to continue to, to think about them, certainly. Um, any update on your dad, Jeff? Uh, he's, he's back in the hospital. Uh, he's back in the hospital. Right, let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are thankful to you for this day and for each day that you provide us with and all the blessings that you give us each day of our lives. Father, we are thankful for the opportunity to be together tonight, thankful for each one who is here, and pray that as we study together and as we spend this time together, uh, that we will be strengthened and encouraged uh, and uplifted by those things that we spend our time doing. Father, we are mindful of those who cannot be with us tonight, those who are uh, facing uh, medical issues and physical difficulties of different kinds. Especially, Father, we're mindful of Naaman Good and Frida Sadler and John Fultz as they all are uh, in the hospital and, and struggling with uh, different uh, health concerns. Father, we're also mindful of uh, Linda Bramlett and Mindy Sims and uh, Ruth King and those who are continuing to go through treatments and those who are recovering from procedures and trying to, to gain strength. And Father, we are thankful that you provide us with so many uh, opportunities and resources uh, to help us to uh, gain strength and, and to improve our health. And Father, we understand also that uh, behind all of that and, and in above all of that, that you are uh, our God and, and, the, and the great physician. And we are thankful that you do watch over us and care for us as you do. Uh, please be with us, Father, as we study tonight, as we think about Jesus and his compassion in this world, and as we think about the compassion that you and he continue to have toward us uh, in our lives today. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. Thank you for the gift of his blood that was shed for us, his death and his resurrection, and all that we have through him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> We're going to uh, kind of go in a, a little bit different direction tonight uh, as we think about the compassion of Jesus. We're, uh, we've been looking, you know, most of these lessons have really been about healings. They've been about people that Jesus impacted personally as far as their physical lives were concerned. 
Uh, and tonight we're going to look at something a, a little bit different toward the end of Jesus' life. And it, it, actually, we are right at the end of Jesus' life tonight as far as uh, we are going to be looking at the upper room uh, in John 13 through 17. And this is the, uh, the night before he was crucified. And here's where this story differs. There are no physical healings that take place. Uh, there, there is no, you know, miraculous feeding of the masses or, or some other demonstration of, of power from Jesus. What there is, is kind of an intimate moment spent between him and his closest followers and friends. Uh, and the reason I, I chose this text for tonight and chose to include this scene from Jesus' life in this study is because... Um, at least for me, when I think about what's recorded in these chapters and when I think about what happened and all that was said and all that was done uh, during their time in the upper room, um, I see compassion. I see a, a, a Lord who was concerned for uh, these men. He was concerned for, for how they were going to cope with him being killed and then leaving uh, in the ascension sometime later. Uh, how are they going to cope with the hardships that come with that, with the, the persecution they're going to face? How are they going to deal with not having him as their constant teacher and support and strength uh, in, a, in a physical sense? And, and so Jesus was concerned uh, for them, for their, their spiritual well-being. And that's really what most of, of these chapters are about. They're about Jesus talking to the apostles about... Um, their, their spiritual well-being and, and comforting them and encouraging them and giving them hope. And so I, I want to think about uh, this text tonight. Obviously, we're not, we don't have time to read all of it. <clears throat> John provides, uh, obviously, a, a much more uh, thorough record of, of what happens in the upper room than the other three gospel writers do. And uh, so we have a lot of details about things that are said uh, in that room. And, and uh, in those details, we do get this picture uh, of Jesus uh, and, and his feelings toward uh, his followers. The way that that translates for me uh, personally is to understand that, that even during our lives, that God continues to have that same uh, kind of concern for our spiritual well-being. As we face hardships, as we face difficulties, as we face doubts and, and struggles with our faith and temptation and sin, God continues to be concerned for his people. And the things that we see in this text as Jesus, God in the flesh, demonstrates that concern in certain ways. Uh, I think there are some things that we see about our relationship with God in that. And I, I want us to think about that a little bit. Uh, this evening. So we're going to begin <clears throat> with the idea that Jesus demonstrates compassion that is instructive. Jesus was always looking for teaching opportunities. We know that uh, throughout his ministry. He was always looking for those opportunities to teach. Uh, we've looked at a couple of those or a few of those throughout this study even. Uh, and so th there was always that, that desire in his heart to teach and to further the understanding of, of his followers, and uh, much of what takes place in, in these chapters is about him teaching. It's about him teaching them how to love one another and how to serve one another. And, and I, I use this, um, this text from chapter 13. More assuredly, most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is uh, sent greater than him who sent him. If you, ha if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. And you probably recognize kind of the context of that statement. Jesus has just washed the feet of the disciples, of the apostles in the upper room. And he's shown this, this great example of humility and service and love. And then he says, if you know to do these things, blessed are you if you do them. So it wasn't just about Jesus doing this great thing for his Apostles, it was about him teaching them that they need to do the same thing for one another. Um, and, and he's going to go on 
and talk to them about loving one another. And uh, in, in later chapters in this same text. Uh, and so he really understood that, you know, for, for three years, there have been these 13 men, Jesus and, and the 12 apostles, who have traveled together, they have uh, worked together, they have learned together. And one of those, well, Judas is going to leave, uh, obviously. Uh, but Jesus is also going to leave. He's ascending back to the Father. And so you've got 11 of those men left. And then, of course, Matthias will be added to the group. But what Jesus understands is they're going to need each other. They're going to need to depend on one another, to comfort and strengthen one another. None of them is going to be able to get through all of these events that, that are going to come up in their lives by themselves. They're going to need each other. It's interesting that, you know, one of the things that happens a little later, the same night, Jesus goes to the, the Garden of Gethsemane. He prays. Uh, the, the soldiers and, and the guard come to arrest him and take him. And it's recorded that all the apostles fled. And so I, I kind of I envision, you know, them just scattering. It's not that they all fled together somewhere, but they just scattered. Uh, and, and kind of went, all went to, to save their own skin and, and maybe hide. And we know that John will end up uh, in the place where Jesus is, and Peter will. Uh, none of the others were told anything about uh, where, what they do the rest of that night. Uh, but that idea of, of them you know, scattering and all going their own way, and, and, and Jesus understands that that's not going to get it. They, they need something better than that. They've got to stick together. And so he's, he's teaching them, he's instructing them, uh, even in these last moments, about things that are going to be vitally important for their faith and for their success. Um, in Matthew chapter 7, we find the <clears throat> conclusion of what we call the Sermon on the Mount. And as Jesus wraps up that teaching, that body of teaching, he, he gives a... Uh, maybe a, a short parable uh, to end uh, that with. And in verses 24 and 25, Jesus says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rock descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Here's what occurs to me. You know, we have... Uh, we have the Gospels in our possession, and, and we have many of the words of Jesus, certainly not all, uh, just a, a sampling, really, uh, of, of the teachings and the words of Jesus, but we have everything that God intended for us to have, I believe. And, and then you have the rest of the New Testament that Jesus, in, in this text, in John 13 to 17, in this text, he's going to tell them, I'm going away, but I'm not going to leave you alone, right? The uh, the the spirit of, of truth, of understanding, of knowledge is going to be sent to you. And he's going to tell you all that you need to know. And, and from that gift, from that spirit, was given the rest of the New Testament. And so we have this body of, of instruction, this body of teaching. And what occurs to me is that during Jesus' life, when he was sitting on that hillside teaching the, the Sermon on the Mount, when he was in the synagogue teaching those who were gathered around, uh, when he was wherever it was that he found himself, Jesus was always showing compassionate instruction. He was always teaching people how to live after he was gone. That's what he was always doing. And, and we see it you know, kind of in a microscope uh, in, the, in the upper room, but we see it every day of Jesus' ministry. We see him teaching people how to live based on his teaching and his example. And he's preparing them for what's coming, which is the church. And, and so we find what we see in the upper room is what is always happening. And, and Jesus, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, says, you know, if you will listen and do those things that I'm telling you, your life will be like this, this house that's built on a rock. The foundation is firm, and it doesn't matter how big the storm is. You're going to stand firm, and your house is not going to, your life is not going to fall. And so Jesus' compassion has always been 
and continues to be instructive uh, toward us. And then uh, in 1 Peter 2.21, Peter's writing about suffering, really, and more precise than that, writing about suffering at the hands of, of evil men and persecutors. Uh, and he's telling the Christians to, to hold up underneath that persecution and, and to not uh, let it get to them. But he says in verse 21, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. In a couple of weeks, maybe, a week or two, uh, we're going to think, when we're, as we're thinking about the compassion of Jesus, we're going to think about the cross. And we're going to think about the way that Jesus suffered. And, and I'm not talking about uh, all the things that he went through. I'm talking about the attitude with which he suffered, the heart with which he suffered. And some of the things that, that he said and did during that, those few hours of time uh, that, that demonstrate compassion. And what Peter says is, Jesus did all of that to leave us an example so that we would know how to deal with those same types of things. And so his compassion for us is instructive, always teaching us to be better, always uh, wanting us to move forward in our faith and in our strength. Any thoughts on, on any of that? There may be another place in, the, in this text in John that you... Uh, particularly think about with regard to this or something? When we go through suffering, you know, a lot of times our prayer is, you know, pray for comfort. You know, maybe our prayer should be more of thanking us for the suffering. What, where, how can I grow from this? What can be positive to be comforted about this? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you wonder, you have to wonder, or at least I do, um, you know, we read those things uh, fairly early in the church's history. Acts chapter 4 and 5, we, we begin to see a lot of that. Uh, and so those things are happening. It hasn't been very long uh, since, since Jesus, uh, since they had this conversation in the upper room, right? It's... it's 50 days between the time that Jesus dies and the, and the church is established. We don't know exactly how long between Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4 or 5, but it wasn't all that long. And so this, this, it hasn't been this huge gap. And you'll wonder, I do at least, you know, how often did their minds go back to some of the things that Jesus said, maybe even on this night. And some of the things that they, they remember him, him saying when they're standing before the, uh, the, the Sanhedrin and standing before enemies and testifying. And, and what do they remember? I think about John 16, 33, right? And, and I think I've got that verse in here later on in the lesson. But um, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Uh, you know, how often did Peter and John think about that as they're standing before enemies who are threatening them or beating them? Uh, and so Jesus had, had spent this time in his concern uh, for them, instructing them and giving them examples and teaching about what to do and how to live uh, after he uh, was, was no longer with them in a, in a physical sense. The second thing that I, I think about when I think about this text is that Jesus provided in, uh, compassion that was encouraging. Um, you might also, I, I also thought of words like reassuring or comforting. Uh, Jesus, one of his, I, I believe, I, I can see it in this, this text, is one of his primary goals and functions for this night was to comfort. Uh, he understood what was about to happen. They didn't. You know, even as they leave the upper room and head toward Gethsemane, they still don't completely understand what's going to happen. Even as the, the group comes to arrest Jesus and take him away, they still don't understand exactly what's going to happen. 
And, but Jesus understood perfectly what was going to happen. And, and so he wanted to encourage them. He wanted to, to comfort them. Um, I, I used uh, on this John 14 and verse, uh, verses, verse 3. If I go and prepare a place for you, uh, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am there you may be also. One of the most, most difficult things, it seems to me, as you read through the Gospels that the apostles had to struggle with was the idea of Jesus leaving. Uh, you remember when, when Peter withstood Jesus, right, and said, Lord, you know, Jesus starts talking to them about him going away, and, and, and what Peter says, in essence, uh, is God won't allow that. You know, God forbid. God, God wouldn't allow that to happen. And that's when Jesus stands uh, before Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. Um, and and they, they struggled with this concept of, of Jesus going away. You know, they had left everything, right? They had left their, their jobs, their families, uh, everything that they knew they had left to follow him, and now he's going away. And, and they're struggling to understand that. And Jesus, in texts like this in John 14, want them to, to understand, yes, I'm going away, but, but I'm not leaving you alone. I'm not abandoning you. And so he talks to them about going to prepare a place and then coming to, to receive them. He talks about the, uh, the, the comforter that's going to come be sent to them or the spirit of, of truth. And, and he talks to them about these things and, in fact, says to them, uh, unless I go, these things can't happen. You know, there are some things that, that Jesus understood needed to happen, but they couldn't happen until he left. Uh, and so it was all part of the plan. Uh, but he, he wanted to comfort and encourage them. There's that John 16, 33, that, that text I mentioned a moment ago, uh, where Jesus says, be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. You know, these, these things that you're going to face, these difficulties and hardships, I've, I've overcome them. And so if, if I have, you can. Um, I, I think about one of the scenes that, that I really, I, I, it doesn't sound seem right to say I, I really like this scene because it's not a very pretty scene uh, necessarily, at least from the standpoint of Peter, but I, I like Peter. I like, Peter's real. I like that Peter is real. He's, he's just very real. Uh, and um, as they are leaving the upper room, sometime between when they leave the upper room and when they get to Gethsemane, Peter and, and Jesus have this conversation. And, and Peter, uh, Jesus rather, says to Peter, uh, you know, well, he says to all of them, you know, tonight you are all going to be made to, uh, to, to flee, uh, made to be afraid, made to fail uh, because of me, be ashamed because of me, whatever. And, and Peter, as always, you know, he's the one that always has something to say and doesn't hesitate. Everybody else might, but not me. And then that's his comeback. Every, you know, even if all these other losers do, I'm sticking with you, right? Even if I have to die. And, and Jesus said, then tells Peter exactly what's going to happen, right, in, in the coming hours. Three times you're going to deny me. And, but he, he says, to, something that he says to Peter in that text, he says, Peter, Satan has asked for you. He wants to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you. And when you return, strengthen your, bro your brethren. Even before any of this happens, Jesus is, is telling Peter, you know, I'm not giving up on you. And that's one of the things, scenes we're going to look at before this, this quarter ends is that scene in John 21 where Jesus restores Peter, but at, th at that point, Peter is telling Jesus, or Jesus is telling Peter, rather, Peter, I, I haven't given up on you. But even before any of that, before Jesus says, I don't know him, I, I don't know what you're talking about, I'm not one of his, even before any of that happens, Jesus is already saying to Peter, Peter, it's okay, I'm not giving up on you. When you return, you know, you're going to come back, and when you do, strengthen your brethren. And Jesus, no matter what was happening, and in that moment, I think about the fact that in that moment, Jesus was beginning. Uh, you remember when Jesus and the apostles enter the, the Garden of Gethsemane, 
that Jesus, the text says that Jesus says, I am sorrowful, even to the point of death. So weighed down was Jesus with grief and with, with concern and with dread and, and whatever other human emotion was overwhelming him at the time. Even as all that was beginning to build, as they're walking toward Gethsemane, Jesus still takes the time to encourage Peter. And that's what he always did. His compassion was such that even in his most difficult moment or moments, he still found the strength to encourage others. In Romans chapter 8, Paul is writing and, and <clears throat> beginning in verse 35, he says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. When I read that, that text, and there's nothing that can happen uh, in this life, Paul says, that will separate you from the love of Christ. In other words, he will always love you. Uh, and, and that love and that, that concern and that encouragement, it will always be there for you to, to hold on to and take advantage of. And then I think back to that scene we just talked about with Peter. And Peter is going to fail miserably uh, on, on that night. But Jesus still loved him. And he was going to continue to love him. And there's a... After the resurrection, as people are beginning to... to or Jesus is beginning to appear uh, to different people. He appears to the, the women who come to the tomb, of course. And, and the message that he gives them is, Go and tell the apostles and Peter... That's powerful to me. Because Peter had given up. I, I believe that's what I think. Peter had given up. He had failed. And when he looked into Jesus' eyes, when the, when the rooster crowed, and understood what had happened, and that he had failed in the biggest way, he gave up. And so Jesus says to them, don't just tell all the apostles. Make sure. Make sure you tell Peter. He needs to hear this. He needs to know. Um, Jesus' compassion is encouraging. And then, finally, Jesus showed compassion that is interceding. Uh, chapter 17 of John, this, the last chapter of this text, of, of this upper room text, uh, is a prayer prayed by Jesus is the longest prayer by far uh, that we read from Jesus and there are three main parts to the prayer he prays for himself and that that God will be glorified through him and through the things that that are done and then he prays for his apostles the men who are in the room with him that they will be strengthened that uh, that God will take care of them that uh, they will be cared for and protected. Um, you know, don't take, I don't want you to take them out of this world, but keep them from the evil one, he says. And, and then the final part of that prayer, he says, I pray also for those who believe on me through their word. Well, that's everybody. Now, that's everybody in this room, I mean. That's everybody who was ever taught the gospel and, and responded to it uh, positively that's everybody from from acts chapter 2 forward who were baptized into christ and became disciples of christ jesus prayed for us all and he he interceded for the apostles on that night in prayer in their hearing as they're sitting around the, the table or or 
in the room there, he, he prays and prays for them specifically and asks these very specific things about them or for them and interceded for on their behalf. And um, Romans 8.34, both these verses that are on the screen tell us the same thing, really. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Hebrews 7.25, Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for us. So here's the question, and I'm going to ask for your input, and I'll try to, repeat what's said so that everybody can hear it and that kind of thing, but what do these verses mean? When we're told that, that Jesus continues to intercede for us, to make intercession for us, how does that happen? What does he do to make intercession for us? Okay. Just as he did for the apostles, right? And in, in, in the apostles' case, in this text in John 17, Jesus was still in, in earthly form, in, in bodily form, and so he, he vocally, verbally prayed to the Father. He's not in physical, bodily form anymore. He's, he's uh, a spirit once again, but he's still there at the right hand of God. He has the Father's ear, and so he still goes to the Father on our behalf. He intercedes for us. And when you read, if you read the, the part of chapter 17 where Jesus is praying for the apostles specifically, and, and think about the things that Jesus prays for concerning them. Maybe there are very similar things that Jesus intercedes for us about. You know, I, does he ever say about me or about you, Father, I, I don't want you to take him out of the world, but keep him from the evil one. Does he intercede for us? Any other thoughts on that? Yeah. Our advocate. The idea of uh, our lawyer, our attorney, our spokesperson. Uh, he pleads our case. And the way that Jesus pleads our case is, is not necessarily by saying, you know, he didn't do it. He's innocent. He pleads our case by saying, yeah, he's guilty, but... I've already paid for that. Already taken care of it. Any other thoughts? As I think about this uh, scene in this text, there's a lot there, a lot that's said, and you can you can work your way through it and, and read. Um, a lot of what's there and, and see maybe maybe as if you went home tonight and you sat down and you read chapters 13 through 17 of John maybe you would would read it through the eye of of compassion that you would see the compassion coming out as Jesus spoke and as he worked um, you know when he washed the apostles feet Judas was in the room he washed Judas's feet uh, knowing what was going to happen, right? Because just after that, he has a conversation about it. Just after that, Judas is going to, to leave. But Jesus knew who it was and what he was going to do, and he still washed his feet. He still had that kind of, of compassion uh, and, and care. Compassion that is instructive, that teaches us um, through his example and through his, his teaching what we are to be, how we are to live, T uh, compassion that is encouraging, that comforts us, that reassures us, uh, and, and if, you, if you put Jesus' words or his actions kind of sometimes into, into our language, the way we talk, uh, you know, much of what he, he says uh, to Peter, for instance, I keep going back to that, but I, I you know, that means something to me, but it's going to be okay. 
you know, Peter, things are going to get hard, but it's going to be okay. Peter, you're going to mess up. It's going to be okay. Peter, what you think you're going to be, you're not going to be. But it's going to be okay. When you come back. And so Jesus is reassuring, comforting, encouraging. And he continues to be. As we look at at the the New Testament and and read the not only in the life of Jesus but in all all the New Testament we find these these promises and these reassurances uh, page after page that God provides for us telling us it's going to be okay Um, and then finally compassion that is interceding Uh, just as Jesus prayed for the apostles and for us on that night he continues to intercede he has the father's ear uh, and he continues to speak on our behalf to to go to the father for us Barry. It's hard to imagine, <clears throat> excuse me, I've got my annual sinus uh, thing going on, and, and uh, but it, it's hard to imagine uh, Judas experiencing what he experienced and, and still going through with it. You know, he, he, after the fact, he goes, and, and I don't know whether he was trying to stop it. I don't know whether he was just trying to ease his conscience when he took the silver back to the, uh, to the, the high priest and... and Threw it at their face. I don't know what his motive was there, but it was too little, too late, as we know. Um, but to to be in the room and to see what's happening and to hear Jesus and to hear what Jesus says to him specifically uh, had to let Judas know that that uh, you know he knows he understands exactly what's going to happen and and how he could still leave the room and go through with it is is beyond me. I, I don't I don't know. Anything else? Jesus had had always kind of had that confidence in Jesus, and interestingly, it's immediately following that scene in Matthew 16 where he says uh, to Peter, I'm, "I'm giving you the keys of the kingdom." It's immediately following that that it text tells us that Jesus begins to talk about going to Jerusalem and dying, and that's when Peter says, "No, Lord, it, it can't. It's not going to be that." Immediately following that, so and Peter goes from this mountaintop, you know, "I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom to get behind me, Satan," real quick. You know, and, and so, and that was kind of Peter's life. Peter always kind of did that. You know, Lord, even if everybody else fails you and I have to die, I'm not going to do it. I don't know who he is. You know, and so that's kind of Peter's uh, M.O. And, and, and throughout his early, uh, throughout the Gospels. Now, as he matures, you know, Peter's going to uh, do better. Although, you know, Paul says he had to call Peter out uh, for, for treating the, not treating the Gentiles uh, in the in the same way he was the Jews, and so still, even at that point, Peter was still kind of struggling with some things. But um, I've often wondered, as Peter wrote the letters of First and Second Peter, how often he he thought back to some of those times and those conversations and those scenes and what he said and what Jesus said, and and how much that influenced kind of the words that he used as he as he wrote uh, those two letters. But any other thoughts? All right, if not, that's all I've got. We got done early. (laughs) Maybe by like 30 seconds or so.
whether you're a member or a visitor or those that are viewing us via live stream. But if you are here, we would like a written record of your attendance. So if you could please fill out an attendance card and pass those down to the end of your row where our junior ushers will pick those up. Leading us in our service tonight, the first song leader will be Jacob Dozier. Michael Sims has our devotional message for the evening. Ray Brown will lead us in the song of invitation and we'll have a closing prayer by Rusty Hills. We've got a lot of updates to what's already been listed in Newsline. Of course, in terms of our member care, we have a number of people that are in need of your prayers at this time, so please remember the following. Fred Wells will have major back surgery tomorrow morning at Crestwood Medical Center. It's gonna be a big surgery. He's gonna have a titanium rod, plates and screws put into his back. The surgery will be sometime around 5 to 5.30 a.m. And that'll be at Crestwood Medical Center. And it will involve him having to stay in the hospital for a couple of days. So please pray for Fred that everything goes all right in that, in that endeavor. We also want to pray for Mindy Sims. She's having a difficult week with some side effects from her recent procedure. So keep her in your prayers as well. We do want to remember Dee Dee Sutherland. This is a co-worker of Robin Brumlow. And we want to express our sympathy to her in the recent passing of her son, Jared. The address for cards is in Newsline. Also, Larry Landman, this is the uncle of Sheila Landman and Lisa Jones. He had heart surgery yesterday, and please keep his recovery in your prayers. His address is also on Newsline. We want to remember Skylin Owens. This is the daughter of Gary and Marilyn Holtzheimer. She's had some medical tests this week. Keep in your prayers that she gets some good results. Those in Huntsville Hospital include Naaman Good. He is in a room now. That room number's on Newsline. Doctors were able to put in a stent on Monday evening, and I heard word that he may be going home pretty soon and his bypass surgery has been postponed at this time. John Foltz will be leaving Huntsville Hospital and he'll be going to Regency Rehab. Uh, also in terms of rehab, Lisa Daniel is supposed to come home Friday from Millennium Rehab and I know she's pleased about that and Frida Sadler is at home with home health care at this time. Uh, and far, as far as upcoming events, don't forget that this Sunday, for those of us whose last names are A through M, we have our Barnabas Project Congregational Meeting that's either 4.30 p.m. or 6.15 p.m., and please make plans to be part of that. Also this Sunday, there will be a bridal shower in honor of Deanna, um, Deanna Kelly, the bride-elect of Garrett Williams. That will be this Sunday from 1.30 to 3.30 p.m. in the dining room. The couple is registered at Dillard's and Zola.com. Will and Hands Ministry will meet on Monday, May the 2nd at 6 p.m. in the dining room. And please be aware of those of you who use the fellowship hall that the Buckhorn High School AP testing will be taking place next week and check the newsline for that schedule. Elder and Deacons meeting will be Thursday, May the 5th at 6.30 p.m. in the small auditorium. And then finally, senior reception. That'll be Sunday, May the 15th during our p.m. service and following. Uh, the events will take place in the auditorium and fellowship hall. And please bring a non-sweet finger foods and our five graduating seniors this year are Trenton Benson, Parker Clark, Seth Davis, Eden McLean, and Gavin Weeks. And congratulations to them. So as you can see, we've got a busy time right now. Make sure that you're aware of all the events taking place by checking on Newsline each day for new updates. That's everything I have. Let's go ahead and uh, start our service now. Our first song tonight will be Count Your Blessings. We'll be seen in the first and last verses. When upon last billows you are ten.
passage that comes in, uh, that we find in Luke chapter 5, beginning in about verse 17. And I'm not going to read all of this, 17 through 26. I won't take the time to read all of that, and it's a passage that I'm, I'm confident that you are familiar with. Uh, I'm sure that you learned it in, when you were in Sunday school, and the passage where these men bring a crippled man to Jesus and lower him through the roof. Uh, and where Jesus heals him. You know, this is certainly a remarkable miracle that we see Jesus performing. And based on the other parallel accounts, we know that this occurred in the small city of Capernaum, and which was sort of Jesus' hometown during uh, the majority of his ministry. And we also notice that here that um, it's, it's friends who are bringing this man to Jesus. And it was through their persistence and their willingness to overcome these obstacles that they are able to bring him and, and ultimately get him to Jesus. It's a reminder to us that, you know, we need to be open to, to seeing opportunities to help others in our lives so that we might be a friend to others and to help someone uh, come to the Lord. And sometimes it takes more than one friend to do that. But uh, this paralytic man was surely seeking uh, physical healing. Uh, he wanted to be healed, and certainly they had heard the news about Jesus. The, even the scribes and Pharisees had come from, I believe Luke's record says, every city uh, around the region. And the, the amount of people that were there created this great obstacle for them to get around and, and to figure out how to, how to devise a way to get to Jesus. And so we see that once they do that and they figure out a way, that Jesus uses this opportunity to demonstrate far more than just a healing. Uh, he is going to use this as an opportunity to directly confront the scribes and the Pharisees about some of their spiritual misconceptions and some things that were um, very popular in that day. Have you ever wondered why the very first thing that Jesus asked or tells this man is that his sins are forgiven? Um, we understand that Jesus had a purpose for everything. So as this man was lowered down and everybody, all eyes were upon him, Jesus says, man, your sins are forgiven. And to, as we think about that, certainly, obviously, knowing that he was looking for, for physical healing, uh, think about the value, though, of, of the spiritual side. Um, and wouldn't that, uh, on, its, on its own, be enough to overcome the obstacles to get to Jesus? You know, one of the spiritual misconceptions in, this, in, in the first century was that uh, misfortune, human suffering such as this, were, were directly due to some sin that the person uh, might have uh, con, con, conducted. Uh, so in other words, if you, had, if you were blessed physically, maybe like the scribes and the Pharisees, you had everything going good for you, then God was blessed with you, God was pleased with you, and you were receiving all of your blessings from God. And yet, if you had some malady, some affliction, some bad thing that was in your life that for the most part you were looked down upon, uh, questioned, maybe you, you had committed some great sin and that's why God had allowed that to happen to you. You probably recall on, a, on an occasion that Jesus' own disciples asked about a blind man. They said, Rabbi, in John chapter, I believe it's John chapter 9 and verse 2, they say, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind. And so you may also recall that Jesus answered that neither this man nor his parents sinned that, that caused that blindness, but that the, the power of God could be displayed in him, and uh, I must work the works of the one who sent me. Uh, so as, as this man is lowered into, this, into the crowd around Jesus, everyone's eyes would have been fixed upon him. And as Jesus pronounces forgiveness of sins on this man, the Jews immediately, in their reasoning, they begin to, to reason, this man is speaking blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins, and at least on that point, they are right. They rightly recognize that only God has the authority to forgive sins, and yet all the scribes and the Pharisees did not claim even themselves to have that ability to forgive sins. Yet they are unwilling to recognize the, the true source of Jesus' teaching and his power and his authority. And so when Jesus responds in verse 23 by asking, which is 
easier? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say rise up and walk? And so the reality of this is that ultimately it, it requires God's interaction to, to be able to have any authority on either situation. But Jesus focuses the attention um, on the true source of his, of his power and his authority, that, that his power and authority is directly from God. And Jesus confronts the Pharisees at the heart of their own spiritual misconceptions regarding sin and affliction. If Jesus were only to offer forgiveness to this man and leave him in this physical state, the, the Pharisees could easily have said, well, you know, he, he didn't really forgive his sins. And yet we see that by Jesus removing this affliction, removing this badge of shame uh, that, that this man had suffered, um, is a, was the, the testament that, that gave them no leg to stand on. To the honest hearts in the crowd... The healing is a clear demonstration that Jesus truly did come from God. And the Pharisees, being forced by their own logic, would be unable to accuse Jesus in saying that the man's sins remained. The only option would be to admit that Jesus truly spoke with authority and the power of God. Tonight, if I were to ask you which of the things that this man received was the greatest, what would you say? Was it the fact that he could walk, maybe for the first time? Or was it his forgiveness? I think we would all agree that it was the ability to to be right with God, to be clean, to be forgiven. And you know, we, we, we still today have that ability, don't we? Jesus still offers that invitation to us. The good news for us is that he still has the authority, the power, and even the desire to forgive sins. And maybe the question is not, can Jesus forgive our sin, but what obstacle do you find in your way to that forgiveness? And maybe you need the help of of your friends here tonight. Uh, Maybe there's something, maybe you've received that forgiveness, but you still have things and afflictions that we face in this life. We know that um, we at all times need friends and, and help. So whatever your need tonight, why not come? as we stand and sing. Before our Bible study tonight, Tommy Weeks and I uh, talked for a few minutes, and he gave me a, uh, a note that he had written, and we talked about it, uh, and I want to share his thoughts with you, Tommy and, and Wendy and Gavin.